Hi, Roberto. How are you? You got your earplugs on. Awesome. Yes. I mean to wear them every time, and then I forget. And Eric will remind me right before, but then I'll get, like, in the zone, and then I'll forget, and I won't hear him. So I, so I, put, I put myself a, a note on my computer and on my... Uh, awesome. That my worked. Desk. It worked. <laughs> Post-it notes are my friend. Absolutely. Me, too. In fact, that's what Eric told me to do. He's like, dude, do what my mom does. Oh, yeah. I got post-it notes everywhere. Right. Uh, you know, we're going to do something interesting today. First, what I want to say hi, Eric, and I love you so much. He said, I love you too, Mom. He said, I want everybody who's watching this video to post some appreciation comments for my mom. Aww. Because she they deserves don't to, it they don't have so to do much. That. He said, they don't have to, but he says, I want them to. <laughs> you tell them. Post some <laughs> sweet ones for Robert, too. No. Uh, he, he said that today was going to be... Uh, a big deal. I don't know. He wouldn't tell me what it was about. And, uh, you know, I was getting nervous about it, you know, because sometimes he'll kind of like give me a little bit of stuff. Just enough of to make you nervous? Well, sometimes he'll like say, okay, well, you know, we're going to talk about these kinds of things, you know, yeah. whatever it is, you know, in the session. And it may not be like him doing it, but whoever it is that, you know, gets pulled in or whatever, they'll, they'll end up bringing up those things. Okay. And, and the questions that you, you ask, well, you know, we'll bring those kinds of answers out. Okay. okay. Well, what I'd like to do is bring, see if Eric can bring um, Freddie Gray, Trayvon Martin, and Michael Brown to the floor. I'm going to ask them some questions. And a blog member has a lot of questions. Okay. Can we do that? Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Go fetch. <laughs> He barked like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Eric said they're all here. These are all gentlemen that were, uh, that died because of police yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. Well, first I want to say welcome, and I hope we can shed light on a very controversial subject that has been really pretty much a tinderbox for uh, for society, and uh, maybe we can bring some peace to so many people. Freddie Gray, first of all, I, I want you to tell me, is there anything about your death that we need to know or about the situation surrounding your death? Uh, he's kind of quiet. Trayvon is the one that's more talkative. <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, Freddie, okay. Well, first thing he said is he's very he's being very polite and he's thanking you, he says, thanking for you for giving them this opportunity. The victims don't always get the chance to speak, but I don't really even like that word. I'm not a victim. Oh, good, good. But that's what society sees me as. It's why people get so angry because of all of this. They got to let that shit go. <laughs> that's okay, what he yeah. said. So he's talking like Eric. Well, let me get Bella. Go ahead. Get it on my lap. He said that a lot of stuff is going around with, about blame. Mm -hmm. And he said what it's doing is it's distracting us from what the cause is. We have to get down to the cause. If you just keep pointing your finger at everybody, you know, well, he shouldn't have done this. He provoked the police or the police provoked him or whatever. He says, you know, you're missing the point. The point is that there's a reason for all of this happening. Right? And, and that reason is what? He said it's, it's because we feel separate from each other. And we say, okay, you know, this person, whether it's their race or it's their, you know, uh, where they were born or their orient sexual orientation, all of these things, he said, they create these divisions between people, and we get into our little camps. And then, you know, we don't always necessarily do things from a place of love. We do things from a place of fear. Well, I want to get to it this. It holds us back. Yeah, I want to get to the specifics of your death. Okay, let's start out with how exactly did you die? How did you break your neck? They say you were banging your head against the inside of the van and... Or, you know, what, what exactly happened? He says no about banging his head. He's showing me stuff. Okay.
Why is he? He said something about a seizure. It's something like a seizure. Oh, okay. So did you have a seizure that broke your neck? One somehow, seizure, some, yeah. somehow, I'm sorry. He's, he's, I'm trying to figure out what he's like telling me. Sometimes I'll just tell you, by the way, sometimes spirits, they all communicate very differently. Mm -hmm. Like Eric is, is very specific. He's very easy to talk to and he's very like conversational. Yeah. Yeah. Other spirits, they will be like a lot of images and yeah. they may not be big on communicating in a way that's like, okay for, you know, some mediums may not be able to interpret it. Right. Well, let's ask Eric. Eric, how how did he die? How Eric said he, Eric said it was an accident. How did, how tell me how that accident happened? How did his neck get broken? He hit his head. How did he hit his head? Somebody pushed him. Okay. They were being too rough. He hit his head. It didn't affect him right away. So I guess he was like, in. you said he was in the van when all this uh -huh, happened? Uh-huh, right. So maybe he had a seizure because of a... Right, right, right. Something happened where he was having a seizure. Because I see him like kind of shaking, like mm -hmm. twisting his head. Mm -hmm. And then like his neck broke. Okay. From, from hitting it, from holding. hitting your head from the seizure or what? No, no. Okay. So there were like people around him. Somebody was holding him. And as this, as his head, because his head was hit, it's like this whole culmination of things. So his, his head got hit. He started like doing all these like seizure like things. People were holding, grabbing hold of him. And in the process of doing that, they weren't holding him right. Oh, and okay. his neck broke. Wow. What police officers were doing that were holding him? I assume. I would assume because they're wearing darker clothes. Some of them are. Okay. It uh, doesn't seem like it was, it wasn't on purpose. Can you take any responsibility for what happened to you? Or is it pretty much all the, the police that are responsible? He said responsibility is shared. It's not ever any one person's responsibility. So everyone plays their part. Yeah, I don't know much about this Freddie Gray because I haven't been following the news. Hmm. So, um, so he, well, you resisted arrest, right? I think that that was part of it. And that can always lead to trouble. I guess so. Maybe that's maybe that's what caused him to hit his head. Yeah. He said he said it is. Okay. And um, he said we got to rebuild our trust amongst ourselves. Well, yeah, we do. He, he said we don't trust ourselves anymore. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, we don't trust the police. We don't trust each other. We don't trust our politicians. We don't trust anybody. And then what happened? Right? We all start acting from a place of fear and aggression. And we just push ourselves apart from each other even more and create more divisions. Well, and then I'm, all this dysfunction goes on. It seems like this whole thing with your death and Trayvon and, and Michael Brown have just made that made everybody more distrustful. My, you, Eric was the uh, victim of horrible police brutality and he didn't yeah. do anything wrong so I can understand do you think that the officers in your case should have been uh, charged and I mean prosecuted or indicted or he said with the way that the laws are set up right now it's just not easy uh, they have to change things but he says you know I've got to tell you even though I've this these horrible things have happened to me and to and to other people, uh, no matter what their race. But, it's, but he says it is kind of heavy in my side of the fence, meaning, I guess, with his race. Hmm. Um, he said, you know, we have to look at that, right? Yeah. We have to look at those divisions. Because he says that, you know, the police force itself is just a reflection of our society. Oh, sure. And how we feel towards people who might be different from us. Well, do so, you feel like... So we have to change that. Yeah. And within our society, and then that will be reflected in our police force. What do you feel like uh, racism is super common amongst police officers? He said for some people it, it is, but he says a lot of it is ultimately all rooted in fear. Hmm. He says, you know, 
He says, when the fear is gone, then, then all those things go away too. Okay. So he said, so calling it racism or whatever, he said, of course it's valid. Yeah. Right. You think, it's it's a, a, you think racism is as rampant in the police uh, department, for example, in the police, among police officers as Black uh, Lives Matter uh, seems to think? He said, well, here's the thing I got to say. Sometimes the police officers who are doing the shooting are black, right? Yeah. Or of another race. Right. He says, ultimately, it's tactics that create these scenarios. Right. What do you mean? For, for the police. You know what I mean? They're the oh. tactics, he says, that they use. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes that can amp it up. He says, I also a big part of it is uh, about a person's class. Hmm. You know, if there is a. Um, you know, if, if you, you know, sometimes people, because of the way they dress or the way they carry themselves, they get labeled as, you know, a lower class or, you know, there's some kind of prejudice associated with that. I think that's what happened with Eric because he wore beat up old clothes and white beaters and, yeah. you know, grungy ball cap. So maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Eric said that certainly affects things, Mom. Mm. He said, "He said I can't tell you how many times I've been I've been with friends and they have a car that didn't that maybe it's older, or I've known people who have cars that that maybe it's older, and then they get stopped. Yeah, like just because they got an old car with you know a, a, a dent in it or something." Yeah. Well, let's talk to uh, Trayvon Martin. Uh, thank you for coming. Could you shed some light on the, the uh, situation, the circumstances surrounding your death that we might not already know about? Uh, he calls you ma'am. He talks differently, too, than Freddie. He said, I own up to my mistakes. Which was what? He said, you know, I'm young. Yeah. Sometimes we young, we young guys, we get a little cocky. Mm. Okay. Don't tread my space. This is all about everybody participating, he says. Mm. I played my part. He played his. And he got, Trayvon said he got rewarded. Who? Trayvon? Yeah. What do you mean? Because he said he didn't have to be here anymore. Oh. Okay. I don't like saying that. <laughs> that makes yeah. me uncomfortable to say that. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, you know, his family is like having to go without him. I know. know? Well, the guy who uh, said, yeah, shot I'm you. Was it from self? I can't remember. The, I'm blanking on the guy's name. Gosh. But well, uh, now, Trayvon, I'm familiar with, and that's with George Zimmerman. Oh, George Zimmerman. That's right. Now, was he trying to defend himself, or was he just trying to do the vigilante type thing? Uh, Trayvon said, "Nah, he wasn't trying to defend himself. He well, was provoking." Said he, oh. he said he was provoking it just as much as I was. Oh. He said we was going back and forth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of talk like Trayvon. I, I don't know. Okay, that's fine. I mean, this is kind of how he makes me feel. He said we was going back and forth at each other. And then he'd come up behind me and he'd start talking his shit. And then I'd turn around and I'd talk my shit right back to him. He said, and I said, man, just fuck off. And I started to walk away and he fucking shot me. Mm. Is it true that uh, that you pounded his head into the sidewalk or something he had he said i hit him because i didn't want us i thought that'd make his ass go away yeah okay. but the fucker wouldn't go away mm. anything else you want to say before we move on to michael and then then i'll present questions for kind of all you all of you guys as a as a group yeah he said I, i'm just glad you gave me this chance to talk Anything else you want to say to the there's public? There's been a whole lot of shit that's out there. I know. Talking about me, he said. Talking about, you know, George. 
Mr. Zimmerman, you know, all this stuff. He said, I, I don't have no hard feelings against anybody anymore. And I mean, it's just, it's just, what's done is done. Just let it, let it go. Okay. Uh, Michael, would you like to talk about the circumstances surrounding your death? Now they say that you tried to grab the policeman's gun when they were putting you in the car. I don't know if that's true or not. He said, how am I going to grab the gun when my hands are behind my back? Oh, so you did not try to, well, was that before they cuffed you maybe? He said, they always, always try and to make something up. I wasn't trying to grab nobody's gun. Mm. He said they was hurting me. Mm. I was trying to get loose. Why? Why would you try to resist arrest? You know it's just gonna get you in harm's way. If you got your finger slammed in a door and it's hurting, wouldn't oh. you want to pull your finger out? Oh, I see, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So they were hurting you. How were they hurting you? My wrists, they were twisting my wrists. Oh, yeah. And my shoulder, it hurts. My shoulder hurts. Mm, that's what they did to Eric, too. Oh, and then they kicked me in my leg. He's like kind of mad. Him and Trayvon are kind of mad. Mm. I can't see a visual of like what this guy looks like. Okay. I mean, is he, do you know what he looks like? Is he a bigger guy? A big guy, yeah. Okay, because I felt a bigger guy. What were you? Beaten like that, and or brutalized, I guess I could say, because of prejudice on the on the, the part of the officers involved. He said, "Well, they kind of scared of me." Well, you're big, yeah. I bet they were. So, so you know, I can't I can't blame them for being scared of me, but I can't say they prejudiced. They weren't all white. So they were just. Scared, maybe. They scared of me. Especially when you started trying to get away. Yeah, I was scared. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't. I didn't mean to scare nobody, you know. Oh yeah, of course not. You can't help that you're a big dude. Um, was this? This is for the whole group. Well, is, first of all, do you want to say anything to the public that would enlighten things, or something you just need to get off your chest? He said, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry that, you know, I had to go. Well, I'm sorry you did too. <laughs> He's like making me cry. Oh. He said, I didn't mean to leave nobody. Oh. <sighs> oh. Mm -hmm. well, so emotional. Yeah, they, they feel me. They send me like deep, like stronger emotions now. So yeah. Oh my gosh. Poor it's Robert. Like no, no, it's it's kind of like a poignant feeling too. So. Yeah. Well, for all of you guys, do you think that this is happening more and more, or is it just more media attention on on this? Eric said, "Mom, you know, I'll speak right now." Okay. Uh, he said, "This has been going on in not just the United States, but in a lot of cultures, a lot of nations. Right now, everything is it's it's more easy to advertise it." You know, to make it aware because people have cameras and all this stuff. Oh, well, that's true. And um, people are much more vocal about what they see that's unfair. Mm. And this is calling attention, he says, to, to the unfairness that goes on in our society because, because of a person's race or their, their economic status or their, you know, immigration status or any of these things. He says, it's just fucked up, Mom. Yeah. And it just, it just you know, it just creates this, this sadness in the world. And, you know, he said, we human beings, we're starting to see that we don't want that anymore. Yeah. And so yeah. all this is getting advertised and we're seeing it and calling our attention to it so that people who aren't aware that this stuff is going on can be outraged about it too. So it's not more common. It's just more advertised. It's more advertised, he says. In fact, he says, some of the brutality was even worse in earlier in history. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Uh, what's the spiritual contract behind your deaths? And, and maybe you need to speak into individually if the spiritual contract is, is different, but uh, yeah, feel They'll, free to do that if you want. They want to talk all together. There's okay. like a bunch of them that just showed up now. Wow. I mean, people we hadn't, we hadn't even seen. There's this little Latino guy. What's your name? Ronald Lopez. 
or Raymond, Raymond or Ronald Lopez. Okay, anyway, that's one of them. Uh, they're all showing up. So, okay, so what was the spiritual? Is it Ramon or Ramon? Ramon, Ramon, that's oh, it. Okay, okay. I don't know. I never heard all of it. All right. I knew it was an R name. I couldn't yeah. make it out. It's like Ronald or. Okay. Okay, so what was the spiritual contract, the agreement? Hmm. To call the attention to the inequities in society, to make everyone aware that we're all the same and that we all deserve the same treatment. It's about pulling everybody together. There's going to be some people that on every side that's going to try and tear that apart. But ultimately, you don't get, you don't have, you, you, you don't have growth without some kind of resistance, right? Mm -hmm. So that little bit of resistance kind of helps to fuel everyone else to want to grow in a way that's healthy. So all these sides, doesn't matter what side it is that you know might be talking about pulling everybody apart they're just there to reinforce the fact that we're all meant to be together by showing us the contrast but it seems like it's made things worse it always feels that way eric says because everything's been stirred up oh. right? eric says you know you stir the sediment up in a, in a jar it looks really horrible mm -hmm. but you know eventually that settlement the stuff's going to settle again right okay. But the big difference in this case is the sediment itself, from a spiritual perspective, when it's stirred up, it doesn't settle back to the bottom. It actually, by being immersed and spread out throughout that water, it actually like kind of like heals it and like dissolves it away. Okay. Uh, what do you think should be done as far as, uh, you know, the policemen are, are concerned? Should so they get extra training. I mean, what, what needs to be done to prevent true, pre I mean, I know a lot of this was, you know, in many cases it's not prejudice, it's like tactics, like you said, and, uh, but maybe the tactics are wrong. Maybe the protocols have to be changed. Maybe they need sensitivity training. I mean, what needs to be done uh, to help on the side of the law enforcement officers? Okay, well, they're all talking together. They said you've got to have, they said you, people have to learn, people learn by example, mm -hmm. right? So we need to have people who are like in the public eye, right? Or people who are of leadership, like in the police force or in the government or whatever, that are showing people how they need to behave. And part of that, they all say collectively is, we have to realize that that's not just on a local level, it's a global level too. We have to treat each other with respect, right? When people start seeing that, Eric says, and, and all of them together, when they start seeing that, then all of these other things like sensitivity training and all that stuff, Eric says that all doesn't matter anymore, right? Because Eric says there's going to be a certain percentage of the population that when you're throwing them into sensitivity training, they're going to be like, you know, fuck this shit. You know, I don't need somebody to tell me how to be sensitive. You know, oh, and they're yeah. going to assist it, right? Yeah. But but if you, Eric says, but if you do things in a way, and, and then the other thing Eric says just now is that uh, there's going to be then, uh, it doesn't solve the problem because now people will just be, you know, in their own little corners and keep that to themselves, right? And they'll have all this resentment in themselves. So Eric says, you know, that's not solving anything, right? Yeah. And later down the road, when we become complacent again, that all that shit will come back up again because mm -hmm. we never healed it. So he said, we've got to lead by example, collectively as a society, individually on a local level, all those things. That then starts to change how people behave, not just the police, but everybody. And then all this other stuff, these tactics and all these things, they become unnecessary. Well, how can we get there? Eric says, that's part of how we evolve as human beings and what this whole thing, all this stuff about it, the police brutality and all this stuff, why it's come out, right? Because we are learning as we go, by example. We're seeing that this sensitivity that we need to have for each other is necessary in order for us to have a healthy society, mm -hmm. right? So this is all part of what we're doing. We're doing it already. Okay. Yeah. Well, it concerns me a little bit now because, um, and uh, the FBI Director Comey said that 
now police officers are getting to where they're afraid to right. do policing in these African American communities, and so that leaves the African Americans so unsafe. And you know, I, I can see their point. I mean, you know, something right, but, could be misconstrued, or you know, they're or you know, there's so much anti police sentiment here. It's they go in and get executed, and right, uh, this, which, this which is, has happened, you know. Well, um, Freddie. That's the first thing he said right from the get-go, is this is all about fear. Mm. Fear on the police part, fear on, in the various communities that they're meant to patrol as part. Mm -hmm. And that fear is what's creating all this divisiveness and, and everything. And that fear... Who's speaking now? Okay, Eric. Sorry, because <laughs> there's so many of them. Oh <laughs> my like gosh! Everywhere. You should have sold tickets, man. I know! Well, you should just, I wish you could feel and see you here. Anyway... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I like lost my, what was Eric going to say? I can't remember what he was going to say now. Tell him again, Eric. I'm trying to reset myself because everybody's here and it's throwing me off. God, it must be hard. Oh, 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 oh thank you, Eric. <laughs> he said, it's about the fear, mom. He said, you know, the fear itself, you know, it, it's all stirred up right now, right? It's all there. It's like it's like you've you've taken you know this rock and blown it up, and all the pieces are there, and all that you know the rock represents fear, right? Mm -hmm. And all of this this change that's going on is like the bullet that hits that rock or the bomb or whatever, and then it blows that rock, which represents fear, into all these millions of pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And it's spread all out everywhere, right? He says uh, so. That's why it looks so horrible, right? And it seems like it's so much bigger, right? But it's necessary because, you know, to use the metaphor of the rock, when that dust all settles, and it will, it doesn't look so big and bad anymore, right? But he said from a spiritual perspective, of course, the rock won't exist anymore, really, right? Because yeah. we will have processed it and transformed it into something new over time. It's just going to take some time, he says. Well, how can you get people not to be a police officers, for example, to not said, be afraid of policing, of doing their job in African-American communities? Uh, uh, uh. Who's Freddie? Freddie is talking. He's, he raises his hand. He's like, let me say. Oh. He said, here's what we have to do. We have to reconnect with our humanity for each other, that we are all humans, right? We have to reconnect with our humanity. Mm -hmm. So we need to have people in these communities that are going out and interacting with people who are not in their communities, creating this camaraderie and this connection to each other. What kind of people? The police, the police officers? No, no, well, I'm just getting ready to tell you. So okay. ordin ordinary, average, every, everyday citizens, he says, they need to be doing that. But then also you need to have the police going into these uh, places, also these communities, and doing things that are um, building, like not team building. Trust. Like, um, trust building, yeah. Right, right. Like he showed me this visual of like, like these, and this is just kind of an idealized thing. It's an example, Right of like the police having like this little street fair, right? Which I don't see the police doing this, but I could see that it would be a great idea. Yeah. But these little street fairs, right? With dunking booths and all this stuff. Yeah. This is all like fun stuff, he says. This stuff would work wonders. Mm. It's fun, you know? People start to develop attachments for each other, he says. Yeah. And who, who, who doesn't love cotton candy? Like, if a police officer is giving you cotton candy, you're going to be like, man, I like this guy. I know, really. <laughs> cotton candy oh. can save the world. Yay. Oh. He says, you know, it's funny, but it's true. He says, yeah. it's simple, and it's so simple. We just, he said, we get into our heads. Freddie seems like a well-spoken guy. He's like, we get into our heads, and we analyze things and make things so complicated, and we completely forget that to be human is very simple. Mm. There's not all this thought you need to put into it. You just connect with how you feel. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What about uh, like a big brother, little brother kind of thing where a police officer can take one African-American you take him under his wing, you know, yeah, you take know, him on his, on his uh, route or whatever you call it. Uh, absolutely. Or just, absolutely. Uh, you know, invite him over for dinner with the family, things like that. That could. Yeah. Be I mean, me personally, I think that's a great idea. And, all of them do too. They think that's wonderful. Anything that is building trust. Now and creating some levity yeah. and all that. There's just too much of this, you know. And he love. Says, love. You know, exactly. Eric said Eric said mom. Eric said, Mom, you know, all all this, you know, we've 
this is this is a lot of this he says is just stirred up from like this whole masculine thing you know we have a masculine culture of you know yeah. you know ooh, you know i gotta be the dominant one in the top yeah. you know in the situation and all that stuff he says and it's a uh, you know, he said, that's just, that era is coming to an end. Good. And, you know, all this stuff's getting stirred up because, you know, that old way of being is wanting to get its last little hurrah in. Yeah. Well, now, um, to me, it seems like, um, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people say that uh, blacks or in Hispanics or other races are disproportionately... Um, penalize in, in our justice system and I believe there is prejudice first of all they a lot of them cannot afford anything but a public defender and, and so on but I do think that the crimes committed are more am I wrong amongst uh, African Americans because I mean the, uh, the family structure Freddie, Freddie is is speaking now he says He said, here's the thing about statistics, right? You know, he says in, in some races you can see that. But he says what you have to realize, however, is that, be, that if people of a, are a, of a certain eco, eco, Ec economic. economical status, uh -huh. <laughs> socioeconomic status, uh -huh. big word, <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to be less opportunities, right? Yeah. They're going to have to struggle more, right? Hmm. They're going to have to, they're going to do things that, uh, to survive. To survive, right? And uh, so he says, I can't speak for all races. I can't speak for the African-American race because I won't. But he says, whenever you see those kinds of things, it's pointing attention not to the fact that that race is dysfunctional, if that's what's going on in it, but that society is. Yeah, because of course. That, because that group is not getting the support from society that they need, yeah. right? He says, and, you know, it's, it could be any race, right? Yeah. And, and the family structure, it seems like the family dynamics of the All of, of African-American has really suffered. And that's obviously a reflection of society, too. It, it is. And it's also, you know, he says, and of course, that goes back to the structure, you know, the, the financial stability and all that stuff, too. You know, if, if mom and dad are both having to work or, you know, and he says this affects every race also. But, you know, if they're having to work or, you know, if, if um, uh jobs opportunities are not available those things you know they just they just create this downward spiral yeah and then they get into trouble and then they sometimes and then they get killed. blamed for the fact that they got in trouble not realizing that the whole reason we got in trouble in the first place is because we we needed help yeah but you still have to have personal responsibility for it of course you do you of know, course you do. as but an society, adult right freddie's kind of like Go going back and forth. He said, "Of course you do." Yeah. But you also have to realize, though, that it's unfair to tell a person that all the responsibility is on their shoulders. Oh no, of course no not. The ever. situations, the the circumstances are right. sometimes not and very I, fair. Now, what can be done? He said, Let's, "I'm not advocating too that a person just because they're angry at the world go out and do whatever the heck they want. They're, that's just not right. People have to um, deal with consequences." Well, what can we do to rectify part the situation? The, the, part of how you grow, he says. Yeah. What, what, what can you do about the family structure, the, the increased criminality, if there is any? Uh, he says. In certain, seg in this, you know, lower socioeconomic levels. It might not even, I'm not even thinking, maybe it's not even race. Maybe it's all about income. He said, I'll tell you, the thing that's going to work, you know, I mean, of course, he says you've got to have, I'm no expert, he says, but you have to have programs and things to help people, of course, right? But you, the thing that we always mess up with, he said, that I didn't see in life, I see it now, is that you have to also realize that we're all human beings. So we need, there are certain things we need. Aside from material things like, you know, you know, and things to sustain our bodies like food and shelter and money and all of that, we got to connect with each other. This whole session is all about that. It's all right? about connection. We, yeah. we have to love and support each other and nurture each other. People, we don't nurture each other like we did, you know, we've become separate from each other. Yeah. We've, 
we're we're we, you know we sit here and we we uh, you know, we, we talk this nice talk to each other about, you know, love and supporting each other and stuff, but do we do it? No, we do not do it, right? We just give lip service to it. We don't go over there and we hug and hug somebody. If somebody's upset, we just like get all like awkward about it and stuff yeah. and, and don't help them, right? We've got to help each other. When you are loved and you are raised in an environment of love, you know, and uh, he said, I can tell you whether you're rich or poor or middle class, if you're in that kind of an environment, most of the time you come out fine, yeah. right? But a lot of people are not raised that way, and then they raise their kids in, you know, in that way, the way that they were raised, where they weren't connecting to each other. So it's kind of hard. that's the solution. It just sounds yeah. corny. I know it sounds no, corny. No, of course it's true. I mean, but it's true. But I it's, think that it would be a little less pressure if we could get the economy going better and, you know, there's more opportunities for all social economic levels. Right. And the economy sucks right now. Right, right. Well, the it's middle class all, is being but, slammed not, and the poor. The poor are being slammed. They're being just really hurt. Right. And he says, but I'm, I'm not. He says, of course, all that stuff's necessary, he says. Yeah. But. I'm just saying on an individual level, that's what we need to be doing because I guarantee you when we have all of that and we are supporting each other, we create a, a society that is adjusted and well-adjusted and is not out to take something from someone else. Mm. And everything else will grow in the process. The economy will stabilize because there won't be yeah, anybody good. out there to try and destabilize it. Okay. Now, what do you think about, you guys think about Black Lives Matter, that whole movement? They said, we don't have any opinions one way or the other, not anymore. Okay. We, he said, well, we, they said, what we would say is there is always on every side a group to resist that's meant to resist, to create tension. Okay. Whether that tension is good or bad. Okay. And, it's, and it, in order for you to grow, you have to have a push and a pull, right? Something to push against, something to pull against. Okay. So all these groups, doesn't matter which group it is, that's what they do. Well, and then everybody what, collectively then comes together and ultimately does the thing that's healthiest for all of us as a society because he says we as human beings, that's what we want is to live. We want to thrive and continue to perpetuate ourselves as a species. So we're going to live. Freddie's like uh, smart. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Well, the thing I don't like about some of the Black Lives Matter is this whole chanting of pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. I can't remember the chants, but what do you want? Dead cops, when do you want them now? That, to me, is just like so divisive and so unloving and just destroys connections. Right, but he says when in our community, though, a lot of the people in the community, when they see that, doesn't matter what their race is, really. You know, when you see that, there's going to be a certain segment of the population that's going to want that kind of energy, mm. right? It's happening in politics too, right? Oh God, yeah. On it doesn't matter what party, yeah. Right? It both. happens also all parties, right? yeah. But but the thing is, in society as a collective, whether it be in the African American community as a connect collective or any other race or just general, we all see that and we're like, no, we don't want that. We don't want that for our kids. Mm -hmm. He said, we know to do the right thing. So those people are doing us a favor because they're telling us what we don't want. Ah, oh, okay. Well, that's good. Well, I mean, not very much attention has been made of the fact that the backlash of innocent police officers being killed, uh, like in Dallas and other places. What do you make of that? He said, fire with fire just gives you more fire. Yeah. Right? I don't think it's right. Yeah. I think we need to focus on what's going on here. That we're in a state where we're in a transition. And we got to realize that life is life. But we also have to realize that we have to pay attention to all lives. Mm. So in other words, he says, collectively, of course, you know, everybody's life is going to matter. Yeah. But then you have to realize that within that collective, there are some of those lives, though, that may not be thriving as many as well as some yeah. others are. 
Sure. And we have to focus on that too. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Now well, he's just like being thinking and everything. He'll he'll, he'll say thank you, man. Oh. Thank you. And like every time after he says something, he'll say thank you. Oh, sweet. Well, uh, do you think there'll ever be a time in our lifetime? I don't this know, is a long. Next... This is a long one. <laughs> I know. Well, that's probably the only session I'm going to do. Because, uh, but forty years. I mean, when will when will our society evolve in a way that there are no more prejudices based on skin color or socioeconomic level or anything else? When will we get there? Oh, Eric said, "Mom, ever. I... is this what I'm so excited about?" Eric says, "Mom." He said, "You know what?" He said, "Poverty. It can't go away until we unify ourselves." As a species, right? We we can't. Whenever it comes in, by the way, everybody, he like gets me worked up. He's like, ooh, <laughs> poor. You need to He's take a Xanax before the session. Oh my lord, he like just ups my energy, and then uh -huh. I'm like, I almost feel like I'm gonna like get manic, and I'm like, ooh. <laughs> anyway, uh, he's like, oh my god, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. Uh, uh, he said we can't end poverty, right, until we unify ourselves mm -hmm. as a species, as humanity, right? So he says all this stuff that's going on. All these things, he says, you know, they're unifying us, right? We're starting to see that everybody is everybody's friend and everybody's family member, right? So once we get that, which he said, it's going to take a little time. It, it take how long? 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. But especially over the next five years, you're going to really see a big difference. Yeah. Things are going to start. He says, when I say 20 to 30 years, I mean like most of the globe, okay. right? Okay. Uh, when that happens, he said, we're going to start working together. We're going to start realizing we all got to help each other. Yeah. And we're going to start lifting each other up. We're not going to say, you know what, that's another country's problem, right? Yeah. Because we'll realize that that country will affect us if it is always down in the dumps. Yeah. And struggling, right? It'll always need help from us. And the reason it will need help, the reason that exists, rather, is because it's trying to say, look, we're all in this together. Yeah. Right? And when we help those other people and lift them up, that ends up helping us. A strong foundation is built on strong materials. Yeah. Right? And we as individuals are those materials. And so we're all it, part of the collective. Right. If any part of that is weak, then the whole foundation the whole is going to crumble. And we're going to always be living in this place, Mom, of struggle and scarcity. And people who have are going to want to try and protect it from people who don't have. They're going to, you know, uh, the people who don't have are going to want to take from someone else. Right. When we all realize that we're all together and we can, we have the ability to share amongst ourselves and perpetuate more, then we'll let go of all this shit. And scarcity and is an illusion anyway. Eric said, Mom, damn right it is. You know, in nature, of course, uh, it, it, you know, there, is, there are a certain number of resources, right? Mm -hmm. And we as human beings understood that and we created a, a structure based around that, right? to try and preserve some of those resources. Mm -hmm. But we've gotten to a point now where we can create those resources for ourselves. We're getting so close to being able to do that, right? That's awesome. We're almost there. And once we get there, all that will go away. There'll be no more scarcity because we can just create what we need. Yeah. Well, let me ask you one more question, you three guys. Uh, do you have any final important message or piece of advice? You could do it individually or together. I don't Whatever you want. Ah, you know, Rodney King just came in. Oh, okay. Hi, Rodney. He's polite. He said, hi, Dr. Metis. Hmm. He said, you know, I just, they asked me to come in because, uh, well, you know, I'm just cool. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> cool like that. <laughs> but he said, no, seriously. He said, you know, I mean, the words that everyone quoted, you know, we just got to get along, right? Yeah. We just got to get along. That's all I got to say, and that's all we, we have to say. It's just as simple as that. Okay. Anything from Martin Luther King Jr.? Does he have anything to say? Is he around? Because I, I think he the, the world would really listen to him. He had such a wonderful message of connection and togetherness and peace. No, his, his, his energy is making me smile. He's just like, hmm. he just puts off a reverence. I mean, I don't know. You know, he just puts yeah. off a reverence, right? Mm -hmm. He said the work that, 
The thing he says I'll say to you, Dr. Metis, that I'm most proud of is the fact that the work I did was built on the work that people before me did. And the work that I and those who came after me are building on all of that. He says everything that we do as a society is being less focused on one or two specific kinds of individuals. It's all, we're all becoming that light now. And people like myself, like Gandhi, like Mother Teresa, like Medgar Evers, all of them, they were there, they were meant to be that light to help ignite that in other people. Do you have a message for the African American community and also for the police uh, officer, officers? To my community, to our community, because it's yours too. Mm -hmm. I would say you must remember that you are light. Don't let that light burn out. It can't burn out anyway, but don't remember. I mean, always remember, he says, that it can. You think it has, it, it hadn't. Okay, well, I like that. What about for the police, the, all the police officers all over the world? I'm sorry, I'm trying to pick up on. Because Eric's like chiming in too. <laughs> he said, he said, he said, what I would say to my. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Eric, be quiet. Eric. He said, what I would say to my brothers in blue is to remember that we do love you. It's just things are broken right now. They're in the process of mending. They're broken with you. They're broken with us. They're broken in society. But that's all going to be healed. That's good. And whether you know it or not, there's a lot of people that support you. That's awesome. I understood when I was coming up that you had to work with those people who were there to people who, who what we might label at that time and even today as the ones who are in power, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to work with them. You can't come at them with this attitude of, you know, you work for me, right? We work for each other. Oh, I like that. Well, thank you. Anybody else before we close? That's that's it. I think it's really interesting. This is really I thought this would be a real downer, but it's given me a message of hope. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to imagine how we'll get there so quickly, but hopefully we'll try and just remember everybody, we are all human beings first. And Absolutely. we are all part of the collect collective. And anything you do to hurt another person hurts you too because you are also a part of that same collective. That's right. I am you, you are we, you are me, all in part of family. <laughs> there we go. Bye, Eric. I love you, and thank you so much, Rob Robert. Oh, almost you're welcome. You, I almost called you Roger. What the heck? Roger. <laughs> Roger must be thinking about you or something. All right, well, Eric bye. Like, bye, Mom. Bye, sweetie. Bye, Come visit. This is, of course, I'm always there. I know he's there a lot. In your ear. In my ear. There we go. He's talking about giving you wet willies. Oh, God, no, please. No. No, thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.